Hello and welcome fellow coders. Thanks for joining me. Today we are going to talk about a topic that a lot of you have requested and that is Testify. Testify is one of the, if not the biggest testing frameworks for Golang. With almost 60k stars on GitHub, I think it is fair to say that it is hugely popular and widely used. And since you wanted me to create a tutorial, well, here it is. As I started to planning out this video, I wanted to show you not only the basics, but all the facets that Testify has to offer. And that is a ton. So I'm going to split this tutorial series into three parts. That way I can provide you with the best possible content without making an hour long video. So let's get started. But before we go into Testify, let me quickly show you what we are dealing with. We will be fetching some data from a database and then do some calculations with it. You can see right here that I'm inside a Docker container that is running a Postgres instance. And I'm already connected to the Testify tutorial database. The table we are using is the stock prices table and it looks as follows. First it has the timestamp column and second the price column. The prices are sorted from newest to latest and every minute there's another price. The code we are going to write our tests for is going to calculate the price increase percentage between the latest two points. In this case from 20 to 25, which is a 25% increasement in price. Okay, now that we know how the database looks like, let's have a look at the code. The folder structure is pretty straightforward. We have our main file as well as our go mod and go sum. Then we have two packages, the stocks package and the calculations package. The stocks package contains the code that interacts with the database. In here we have the price data struct. It holds the same values as the table in our database, which are timestamp and price. Next we have the price provider interface which defines two functions. First the latest function which returns one price data point and second the list function which takes a date as an argument and returns a slice of price data points. And of course we have a struct which implements all the functions of the price provider interface. I will not go into any detail here because it's irrelevant for this tutorial. Next let's have a look at the price increase functionality which we can find in the calculations package. This file is actually pretty important because it is the one we are going to write the tests for. So I'm going to explain it in a greater detail. The price increase calculator interface defines a function called price increase. It returns the price increase percentage as a float or an error in case something went wrong. Next we have the price increase calculator struct which will implement the price increase calculator interface. It holds the price provider from the stocks package we saw earlier. We use this new function right here to pass a price provider to our price increase calculator. So we can use any struct that implements the price provider functions defined by the price provider interface. Make sure to keep this in mind because we will take advantage of this later in this tutorial. Now let's have a look at the actual implementation of the price increase function. First I use the price provider to get the latest price data. Remember that the list function takes a date as an argument and returns all the price data for the given date. This is why I'm passing in now to get all of today's data. If the list function returns an error, I simply take it and return it to the caller of the price increase function. Next, I check if there's actually enough data to calculate the price increase. If not, I return an error. And lastly, I return the price increase percentage of the latest two points. And that is it for the price increase function. Pretty simple, right? Now let's hop over to the main and see it all in action. Since we are connecting to a Postgres database, I first defined all the constants I need to do that. Further down in the main, this is the point where I actually open the connection to the database. Once the connection is established, I use the create table function to create the stock prices table if it does not exist. I also use the see table function to put in some initial data, but since I've already done that, it is commented out. Now let's get to the interesting part. I first create an instance of a price provider holding the database connection. Using this I create an instance of a price increase calculator. Next I call the price increase function to calculate the price increase percentage. If an error is returned I panic, otherwise I simply print out the result. Now let's check what happens if you run our code. Perfect, we get 25%. If you remember the data from the database, the latest two points were 20 and 25. So we have a price increase percentage of 25%. Since that is exactly what we got while running our code, the price increase function should be working correctly. Okay, now let's finally look at some tests. As you might have already seen, I have already prepared a test file containing one test case. Let's quickly go over it, shall we? Since our price provider gets its data from the database, we first need to open a database connection. 
we will use the same constants as in the main function. Next, we set up our database and then we are going to fill it with some fake data. But since we are using the same Docker instance as our quote unquote real data, we need to make sure that we store our test data into a separate table. As for our test data itself, we are going to put in a price of 1 for the first timestamp and a price of 2 for the following minute. This way we can make sure how the outcome of our test should look like, since we know we have a price increase percentage of 100%. After preparing our table, we can now create our price provider as well as our price increase calculator. And in case you are wondering, yes, this code looks almost identical to the code I wrote in the main function. But since the main is obviously not a real main function, it's okay to have duplicate code. Within our test, the next thing we are going to do is to call the price increase function and store the result into the actual and the error variables. Now we can check if the error is nil. If it's not, we are going to lock a message and fail the test. The same goes for the actual value. If the price increase percentage is not 100, we are going to lock a message and fail the test as well. The last thing our test case will be doing is to tear down the database. Since all test cases should be running independently, I'm dropping the table, the database and lastly close the connection. Now it's finally time to run our test case and see if it's working. And to no surprise, the test did not fail. Even though our test works perfectly fine, there is one thing we can greatly improve and that is the way we write assertions. I think you can agree that writing assertions like that is very cumbersome, since we always have to write our own error message and manually fail the test. This is exactly where Testify comes into play. Testify serves three main purposes, making assertions as easy as possible, mocking and writing super simple test suites. And to no surprise, these are exactly the topics I'm going to cover in this tutorial. Oh, and one last thing, as I'm going to show you, it has an insanely easy to use interface. Now let's hop back into my IDE and then I'm going to show you how you can download Testify. In order to do so, simply type in go get github.com slash stretchr slash testify. This will download the dependency for you. You can see that in my case I've already had it pre-installed but it did get upgraded. Now let's see what we can do in case of our bloated assertions. To use testify's assertions simply type in assert and then have a look at all these functions that testify provides us. It would be way out of scope to explain every single one of these functions but I will get over the ones that I use the most in a minute. But first, let us quickly replace the two assertions that we already have. The first check we are going to replace is the nil check for the error. The error should be nil, right? So we can use the nil function of the assert package to check for that. You can see that the nil function takes three arguments. First, the testing parameter t. Second, the object that we are going to test if it is nil or not. And third, some optional arguments. These optional arguments can be, for example, self-defined error messages. But at least from my experience, I basically never use them. So for now, let's simply put in t and error and we have basically replaced our first assertion. So instead of writing the if check, the error message and the fail function, we can use this one simple, very concise line. And I would like to draw your attention to the fact that I don't pass in an error message. You will see why this is important in a minute. But before I get into that, let me quickly show you a best practice that you can do while using Testify. If you use the exported functions of the assert package, you always have to pass in t as the first argument. To get around that, you can use the new function of the assert package to create a new assertions instance. This assertions instance will hold the parameter t and provides us with all the functions that the assert package has. So we can use the nil function without passing t. Even though this is not a big deal, it still improves readability and therefore makes your tests look a little cleaner. Now we can get rid of this old check and get to the second one. We have to check that the actual value is equal to 100. And of course Testify provides us with an equal function. The first argument we need to pass is the expected value, so in our case 100. And our second argument needs to be the actual value. Now we can get rid of our second old check and run our tests and see if they are still working. Nice, our test case still passes and we are good to go. Now let's see what happens if a test case would fail. For that let's simply change our expected value and then rerun our test case. You can see at first sight that our test case has failed. But not only that, we also get a bunch of additional information that helps us track down what exactly has failed. Like for instance the file name as well as the line and also detailed information about what exactly has gone wrong. In our case we can see that something should have been equal but it's actually not. And we also get detailed information that the expected value is 10 while the actual value is 100. Awesome, right? Remember when I told you that we do not need to pass any kind of error information to the assertion functions? Well, we did not. But yet we got all these additional information. 
Now let's compare that to the old-fashioned way of writing assertions in Go. We would have needed to write if statement ourselves, lock the error message ourselves and fail the test ourselves. And in addition to that, we would have needed to write a specific error message for every single assertion. That is one of the huge advantages of using Testify. It makes writing assertions super simple and super fast. Now let's clean up our test case and make it nice and clean. As promised, I'm now going to show you the functions that I use the most. First we have the nil as well as the not nil functions. These are used to check whether an argument is nil or not nil respectively. Next we have the true function that checks if something is true and of course we have the false function as well. Using the contains function you can check whether a slice or a map contains a specific value. And as you might already guessed, there is also a not contains function. And lastly you can check if two values are equal or not using the equal or the not equal function. One cool thing about those is that you can use them to compare structs. So if you want to check if two structs are equal or not, you don't have to compare every single field. Another very helpful function is the equal error function. You can use it to compare an expected error message to the actual error message. This can be very helpful if your error message contains status codes or error codes. And these are the functions that I use the most. Even though it's just a handful, you can probably get 95% of your testing done by only using these few functions that I just showed you. There's one last thing that I want to show you before I wrap up this video. For this we need to make sure that both assertions fail. Line 40 will fail because the returned error is nil and line 41 will fail because the actual value is 100. So let's check that. Okay, let's clear the terminal and run the tests again. Just as expected, the test case has failed and we can indeed see that line 40 has failed and line 41 has failed as well. Let me explain to you why this might be important. Your test cases might be very complex and take up a lot of time while running. In these cases you might consider failing the test case as soon as the first assertion fails. Let me show you how you can accomplish that. Instead of using the assert package of Testify, you can make use of the require package. Same as the assert package, it also provides a new function as well as all the other functions the assert package has. So replacing it is pretty straightforward. We know that still both checks should fail. So let us now run our tests and see what happens. Even though both checks should fail, Testify only tells us that line 40 has failed, which is the first check right here. So as you can see, the difference between the assert package and the requires package is that if you use assert and both test cases will fail, Testify will tell you every single check that has failed. On the other hand, if you use require, as soon as the first check fails, the whole test case will fail. So in case your test cases would fail, it all comes down to two options. Option A, you can use assert and have slightly longer running test cases, but therefore a full set of errors. Or option B, you can use require and have slightly faster running test cases, but therefore only a subset of errors that have occurred. There is no clear winner which one you should use, because it all comes down to your requirements or your personal preference. So I just wanted to show you how you can use Testify in order to choose the option that meets your needs best. That is it for the assert and require package of Testify, but we barely scratched the surface. In the second video, I'm going to show you how you can use testing suites to bring your testing from here all the way up to here. So if you are not subscribed to the channel yet, make sure to hit the button and also ring the bell. And of course, if you enjoyed watching this video, please let me know by giving the almighty thumb and writing go testify go into the comments. And until next time, keep on coding.